Welcome to this episode of Pharmacy in Flux. We're glad you could join us. Today we're going to do part two of our legal components related to pharmacy acquisitions. And we're happy to have our guest back, Pat Medeisky. Pat was with us for uh, part one, and today's episode is sponsored by Medeisky & Company Business Lawyers. Pat graduated from UBC Law School in 1988, and for the first 11 years of his career, he practiced in a large Vancouver law firm, and then subsequently at a smaller boutique business law firm. In 2000, he established his own firm, Medeisky & Company Business Lawyers, and the firm has grown uh, from then who was just Patrick and his wife, Dolores, to 14 people today, including five lawyers, and they're based in Langley, out in the Fraser Valley. The firm has, uh, over the years, developed an expertise working with healthcare professionals in particular, assisting them with all their business-related needs, including incorporation, uh, commercial leasing, buying and selling of businesses, and corporate reorganization and general contract matters in real estate. So uh, happy to have you on board again, Pat. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Always happy to be part of your presentation. Great. Uh, so I'm alongside here with our, our co-host of the program, Phil Hauser. And, and Phil, you know, we uh, with Pat, we covered a lot of topics last time. Uh, we talked about things like uh, asset deals versus shared deals and the difference between the two. We talked about the importance of a non-disclosure agreement. Um, we also talked about things like uh, um, timing and when's a good time to get your lawyer involved in the process of, of your uh, succession plan. Uh, we talked about no shop and exclusivity clauses and earn out provisions. So we covered a lot and, and we started to touch on employee severance and I think maybe that's a good place for us to pick it up. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Phil, to, to launch our first question at, at Pat and then we'll get into today's discussion. Absolutely. Uh, so Pat, last time we did talk a little bit about employees and certainly when Derek and I represent a, a pharmacy seller, you know, it's a major area of concern is what's going to happen to their employees. And I guess it really comes down to the role their employees play in the business and how big an impact it's going to be. So if employees represent a good portion of the goodwill, in other words, they're sort of seen as, as the representation of the business. Um, how does that affect the, the sale for uh, a buyer and what should they be considering? And also, how does that work? Because in most letters of intent, uh, they'll reserve the right to not keep any of the employees if they don't feel they should. Uh, but that, again, comes to employment agreements and severance and things like that. So perhaps you could expand on that just a little bit more. Sure. Uh, yeah, as we all know, the employees are always a very important part of a business, whether it's a pharmacy or otherwise. And in general, I think they are looked at as assets. So for, from a legal perspective, and if I'm advising a buyer, uh, you know, if, with that as a starting point, I always say as part of their due diligence, they want to make sure that the, to the grace and possible that the employees are going to be, able, are willing to stay on. That, that's the first part. Uh, from a seller's perspective, often they're reluctant to allow access to the employee, sometimes even before the deal closes. Uh, however, sometimes the parties can negotiate that that's a meeting that's done late in the day uh, once all conditions are satisfied uh, because it is important uh, on most deals. And assuming it is important, uh, it's something that a purchaser, uh, they want to know, at least get a good level of comfort that they can uh, retain those employees after the fact. And they also want to know what are the terms of employment? Uh, how long people have been there? What are their duties? How much are they paid? So from that perspective, in terms of them being an asset, uh, it's incumbent on the purchaser uh, to try to get some level of comfort that those employees will stay. Now, I always advise my employees that that's the best they're going to be able to get. Uh, an employee is always at liberty uh, to resign their uh, and give notice. And you'd th usually you'd hope you get a lengthy notice if employees going to go, but a lot of time they'll give two weeks or sometimes no notice depending on the employees. And there may be employment contracts in place that crystallize what that notice is that the employee has to give the employer. Uh, but even in that case, just because there's a contract as employees going to give you six weeks notice, a lot of times they won't. So you can't really count on it. And even if there was a contract that employee agreed to, uh, to stick around for a year, had a year long employment contract, 
if they left, no court is ever going to enforce an employee to work for an employer they don't want to. And as someone who buying the business and employee leaves, it's difficult to pursue a claim and prove your damages uh, uh, if someone doesn't give the notice they're supposed to from an employer to an employee. So if I'm an advising buyer, I say just try to get a level of comfort that the employees are going to stay and that their role is that their uh, your role as buyer is to go in and hopefully just convince them it's going to be business as usual, uh, that their jobs are going to be secure, uh, and hopefully have a good transition period to to the new owner taking over. So on the one hand, they're an asset, but uh, on the flip side, when a buyer is buying a business, they generally don't want to take over uh, liabilities, and the employees are always a big part as well. And the big part of that is if you're taking over the business, what is the potential liability that the buyer will have to the employees uh, for severance pay if it turns out they have to let the employee go without cause? Uh, so to understand how that plays into a business acquisition, I'll just speak for, for a few minutes here on the, the basic legal principles applicable to an employment relationship. So in general, when an employer hires an employee, uh, the Employment Standards Act sets out a regime that says you as employer, if you're letting your employee go, you have to give them at least two weeks of notice uh, after I believe it's one year and then one, one week for every year up to a maximum of eight weeks of severance pay. So that's a minimum that the employer has to give. So assume for each year the employee has been working at the business, you as the employer have to give them one notice if you have to let them go without cause or equivalent pay. So if someone's been there seven years, you would have to give them seven weeks of notice and, or seven weeks of pay. Because when you're letting someone go, you can either give them notice, but a lot of employers say, I don't want an employee in here who knows they're going, I'd rather call them in on a Friday, say, sorry, we have to let you go without cause. Here's your check for seven weeks severance pay. And that's normally how it's done. Uh, but the important point to know uh, or, or realize is that, and a lot of business owners uh, don't understand this, is that what the Employment Standards Act sets out is the minimum entitlement that an employee has. And what that's getting at is it only that's the minimum assuming an employee agrees in writing when they're hired to accept that minimum notice period and i know that most of the time employees do not sign written employment contracts and if your lawyer is hammering on you to get a written employment contract with the employees that's generally the one reason they want it so you have a clause in there that says the employee agrees to accept that notice so let's assume now you're buying a business where None of the employees have written employment contracts. Uh, what applies in that circumstance, or even if you're running your own business right now, if you have employees who haven't agreed in writing to accept that minimum, uh, the common law applies. And that's the law that's developed over hundreds of years that the courts have mandated applies in circumstances between employer and employee. And that imposes the concept of you have to give the employee reasonable notice of termination of employment. And what's reasonable depends on the circumstances of each case. How long has the employee worked at the business? How old are they? How senior are they? How re-employable they are? Uh, so it, it, you just have to accept that the common law imposes a much lengthier notice period, whereas employment standard is one week a year up to a maximum of eight weeks. Common law you're closer to a month for each year of service up to a maximum generally of two years. So if you have an employee who's been with you 20 years and now you have to let them go uh, and you don't have cause to let them go, uh, you, you could be looking at having to write them, you know, a big check, or if you don't give them enough, they might run off and hire a lawyer and all of a sudden you find yourself faced with a wrongful dismissal suit and it can get into some costly litigation. Uh, and just I'll backtrack a second. If you have cause to terminate an employee, you do not owe them any notice of severance pay. Cause are serious breaches of their obligation, uh, insubordination, coming to work under the influence of drugs or alcohol, repeatedly failing to uh, follow directions. But, but as an employer, one thing you have to understand is 
in British Columbia, it's, or in most common law jurisdictions, it's very difficult to establish cause for termination. To simply say you don't need them anymore is not cause. To say I can't afford to pay you anymore, that's not cause. It has to be something serious giving rise to uh, you know, it, it, immediate termination without notice. So, so if we assume on the basis that cause is difficult to establish, then you as a business owner or someone going in to buy a pharmacy, if you're looking at, an, at a pharmacy that has five or six employees, it would be really nice to see that they have in place employment agreements that effectively say that you, an employees, the employees have agreed to accept the minimum notice on termination. So going in, you can make an assessment, okay, even if this 20 year employee or 15 year employee, if we for some reason don't get along or I don't need them or I wanna bring in someone else, I know my exposure is limited to eight weeks notice or eight weeks pay. Where you don't have that, it starts to getting into a situation of, you know, what's my possible exposure here? There's a lot more negotiations between the buyer and the seller uh, in terms of how do we split that severance pay if I have to uh, let them go within three months or six months or a year, because at some point the buyer or the seller wants to know they're off the hook. Uh, and it's, but at some point the buyer wants to try to limit the size of the check they have to write. And that's usually a big part of the negotiations uh, if we have a situation where there's no employment contracts uh, in play. Yeah. That's a, a relatively simple summary, but to take a few points out of it, uh, out of this discussion, uh, uh, without written contracts, assume the common law implies and don't assume it's the minimum requirement. One thing I didn't mention, but I do want to mention is if you're buying a business, it's not as simple as, well, they're new with me, so they can start fresh with me. That's not the case. The Employment Standards Act specifically provides that if someone buys the assets of a business, those severance entitlements flow to the buyer. So you can't just terminate and start fresh. A lot of people have this concept, well, I'll, I'll buy and I'll rehire everyone and the seller will fire them. That doesn't work. And not only is it, the, if you try to do that, it could really lead to a lot of employees leaving when you don't want that. So uh, it, it just it w work with your lawyer. They can help you investigate. Usually things can be worked out and in a perfect world, you, you, you go through the deal, the employees are great and it doesn't become an issue, but uh, the more employees there are, the more senior they are, the more potential exposure to, it, to a buyer, uh, we wanna try to address it. If, it's, if they only have three employees, they've all been there a year or less, you know your exposure potential severance is, is nominal. Once you start getting into five, 10, 15 year employees without written contracts, it, it's something to consider. Great. Okay. A lot of really good information there, Pat. Thank you. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit. And I'm going to come back to a topic that I think we touched on in the last episode, but I'd like to delve into it a little bit more. And that's the whole issue of putting restrictive covenants um, in a purchase agreement to prevent uh, the seller from selling their business and then, you know, opening up a new business, you know, a half a kilometer away or across the street and, and then taking a bunch of their old customers with them. So can you just address a little bit the concept of, of, of restrictive covenants and, and what you might see in terms of, of uh, you know, time periods and, and geographic distances that are kind of normals for those, those types of clauses? Sure. Uh, again, when buying a business, the both from a buyer's and a seller's perspective, the restrictive covenants are one of the most important provisions in the contract. And let's talk a little bit about what those are. Generally, they're going to cover three, three items. Number one is that the buyer, you want to restrict the seller from setting up a competing, competing business within a certain area uh, for a certain specified period of time after you bought the business from them. Uh, usually in Vancouver or lower mainland, that area might be five to 10 kilometer radius in terms of the period of time, five years after closing or three years if they're gonna work for you after closing, three years after they stop working for you is what you might see as, uh, as being uh, appropriate in smaller towns or outlying areas. You might see those areas being a bit larger uh, to cover the entire town because there's only one pharmacy and you buy it and 
then there's not an appropriate restriction and the fellow sets one up on the outskirts of town, you you could find yourself in competition when you uh, when you least expected it and it, it's not appropriate. So uh, in terms of uh, the first covenant, it, don't compete with me within a certain area for a certain period of time. Lower mainland, five to 10 kilometers, period of time, upwards of five years. From a seller's perspective, uh, a buyer is entitled to that protection. They could be paying you hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars for your business. They don't want you setting up nearby and competing with them. Uh, the second part of any uh, restrictive covenant are what are called the non-solicitation provisions. And again, that would be get at the following. If when, Even if you go outside the kilometer radius, I don't want you soliciting my customers. Now, depending on the nature of the pharmacy, a, a lot of customers will go there because of the location, but it could be that they've established a, a relationship with the actual pharmacist, especially a smaller pharmacy or in a small town, that if they're used to going there and that person's gone and they know that this person's six kilometers away, they might be willing to go there just because they have that personal relationship with that pharmacist. So don't solicit the, the customers. Don't do a mail out. Don't advertise and say, hey, I invite all my prior customers from this location to come and see me over here. Uh, and, and the second type of non-solicitation is don't solicit my employees away. And so the length of time of those, again, generally would dovetail with the, the, the non-compete provisions so that you know even if the person goes uh, six kilometers away or you have five kilometer restrictive covenant, that if you do want to set up six kilometers, they're not going to, uh, they're not going to solicit employees or solicit clients. Where it starts getting a little tricky uh, is if you try to say, not only I don't want you soliciting these people, I don't want you dealing with them if they find you. I don't want you hiring any employees. And in certain circumstances, if that gets to be too broad, uh, you, you might find a, a seller, if they want to be aggressive, say, well, I don't think that's enforceable, so I want, you can sue me if you want. And the key principle to, to realize, and your lawyer will work with you on this, is as a buyer, uh, you only want to put forward a co covenants that are reasonable. And the courts have said, if these covenants are not reasonable, we will not enforce them. For example, if someone has a pharmacy in Vancouver and you as a buyer say, I'm gonna give you $2 million for your pharmacy, I don't want you carrying on business anywhere in British Columbia for a period of 20 years after the sale. Anyone can look at that and say that goes well beyond what's needed to protect the interest. So you really have to think about it a bit in terms of what kind of protections do I need to protect what I'm buying uh, to the greatest extent reasonably possible. So the unfortunate thing is th these cases rarely ever would get to court if parties were disputing them be because it's just so costly whether for someone to uh, to start a lawsuit against another person uh, so we're sometimes guessing what is reasonable and what might be reasonable today based on current case law in two years from now there might be a case that changes the tune of what is reasonable uh, or, or not in terms of restrictive covenants. It used to be that lawyers would draft them in a way, uh, and this is going back 20, 30 years, uh, the covenant is 50 kilometers, but if a court finds that unenforceable, it's 40 kilometers. If a court finds that un uh, unenforceable, it's 30 kilometers and down. And uh, so that was how it was done for the longest time, but finally it got to the court of appeal, went to a case, and the judges said, you know, we don't like this approach. This is all, none of these are going to be enforceable. So all lawyers have to start scrambling and say, we can't do this anymore. We've got to come up with a different approach. So if you if you approach it realistically, be reasonable. Between you and your lawyer, you should have, uh, you should be able to come up with something that provides uh, protection for you in terms of the business you're buying. And uh, e even the fact that the seller, if I'm advising sellers, I tell them, listen, don't sign anything unless you're prepared to ab abide by it. If you have a seller whose plan is to retire, they say they can say whatever they want, I'm done. But if you have someone who might be relatively young and maybe in their mid 40s and maybe has plans to open up another pharmacy somewhere, then sometimes you have to negotiate it uh, a, a little bit to something that they can live with and that the buyer can live with. But certainly very, very important. Uh, and it's important to get the scope of those outlined fairly early on in the process so it doesn't, it doesn't 
hang things up closer to the closing date. And often, uh, Phil, uh, it, we... the scope will be set out in the letter of intent uh, it, uh, quite often. Before we leave that topic, Pat, I'd like to just um, come come to it. Um, and I think I know the answer to this question, but I, I want to pose it to you so you can give it to us for this for this episode and for the benefit of our viewers. We'll oftentimes get uh, the question, and it sort of relates back to employment agreements and whatnot as well, is can you put a, a restrictive covenant um, in an employment agreement to prevent, a, so this is nothing to do with the sale of a pharmacy, but to prevent an employee who either you terminate or who leaves on their own from setting up shop across the street. So you're a pharmacy owner, for example, you've got a good pharmacist working for you, they're the face of the business, they're out there, and then, you know, for whatever reason something goes wrong, you terminate them or they leave on their own, can they have something in their employment agreement that prevents them from competing against you? Uh, yes, certainly that's something that you can put in employment contracts for employees. It's something you want to think about uh exactly what you need if someone is going to be the face of the pharmacy as opposed to uh not really interacting with the uh, with the customers you, you you might have to reconsider the scope of it as a general rule if you're doing that the scope and length of time is going to be nowhere near what a buyer will expect from a seller where buyer is paying good value again could be in the millions of dollars for the practice say five, 10 kilometers for five years with an employee who's really not giving you anything or you're not giving them any money, you're just giving them a job. Uh, it has to be a lot smaller and probably can't extend beyond two years maximum in terms of area. Again, if we're talking about Vancouver, maybe a kilometer or two kilometers, I would like to, anything beyond that I think is starting to approach uh, a situation where an employer or if it ever came to it, a court might find that unreasonable. So uh, to answer your question, yes, you can have it in employment contracts. Quite often in any business, you will find employees being asked to sign restrictive covenants. Uh, but in a farming situation, the scope and length of time should be fair, should, are going to be much, much smaller than a situation of a buyer buying the pharmacy from a, from a seller. Excellent. Thank you. So, Pat, last time we, we touched on, on holdbacks, um, and we didn't really expand on it too much. And typically, for us, we see uh, buyers wanting to impose a holdback on share purchases. Um, but can you talk a little bit more, maybe unpack the whole reason for a holdback and what typically um, is the time and limits and perhaps the amounts of a holdback that you might see in a purchase agreement for a share deal? Sure. Uh, uh, and again, let's assume we're talking about a share purchase transaction. Usually what you would see uh, is a situation where the buyer agrees to buy the shares uh, of the company that operates the pharmacy. And when that happens, there is a change of control of that company. And that necessitates that company preparing financial statements and a tax return for the period ending on the closing date. So from a buyer's perspective, the seller is the one who has all that knowledge and information to prepare those statements and file that tax return. So it's a key part of every share purchase agreement that says, I'm going to buy your company, but you, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you're responsible for completing those financial statements and tax return, usually it's done within 90 to 120 days. Uh, and from a buyer's perspective, you also want to make sure that the, that those are done, A, just so that is cleaned up, and B, that you can see what the financials and balance sheets of the company looks like as at the closing date, so that you get what you're supposed to be getting. Whether it's a clean balance sheet, where the vendor has strapped, stripped out all the cash and all the assets and current assets and you going forward just can't start carry on with the company clean or if the agreement is set up in a way for there to be an adjustment for working capital uh the parties have to know what that working capital is so on as an example on a million dollar deal you might see uh usually a holdback is somewhere between five and ten percent so maybe the buyer will hold back fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars and they will say I will only, I'm going to hold this money back and you're not going to get that money until you produce to me those financial statements and they show what they're supposed to show. 
They show that you paid all the bills. They show there's, there's no liabilities. Uh, or they show the working capital that the company was supposed to have on closing date and that you prove to me that you filed the final tax return and that you've paid all the taxes. So that's point number one. It, it's to give the buyer uh, some certainty uh, that, or to give the seller some incentive to, to go through that step and hire their accountant to do it so they get their last installment. Uh, a second reason to have a hold back, which is often negotiated, is uh, the, the buyer may say, okay, I want to hold back. You've represented this, that, and the other thing to me in terms of the financials and the performance. Uh, for whatever reason, we haven't had enough time to complete all our due diligence on this to make sure there's no outstanding claims. A buyer may say for a period of six months to a year, I want to hold back, again, 10% of the purchase price to make sure that nothing comes up within that year. So that there's no claims from creditors that we're not aware of. There's no litigation claims that come out of the woodwork. So the buyer has some comfort that if there are some claims that come out, that they've got a pool of cash that they can at least make a claim against uh, rather than having to sue the vendor and chase uh, and chase down someone who may, may or may not be around to pursue. So usually those terms are subject to negotiation between the buyer and seller. It doesn't mean the buyer can say, hey, there's this unpaid bill, I'm gonna deduct it. There's usually a mechanism agreed where the holdback will be held by one of the party's lawyers. There's mechanisms to make a claim. There's mechanisms for the parties to dispute it if they think there's a dispute. But at least what it does, it allows this pool of cash to be sitting there where once it's resolved, and if the claim is resolved in favor of the buyer, they know they're going to get the money. Third reason you might have a holdback if part of the deal is that the seller is going to stick around for a six months or a year transition period because you need them there or you need them to show you the ropes, you, you tie the hold back to, I wanna make sure that you don't close the deal and disappear on me. So if, if it's $100,000 in each month that you stay, you get one twelfth of that release. So not only do they get their regular salary or consulting fee, they get part of the purchase prices tied to them leaving. And so something happens to them that, that causes that they can't fulfill their obligations, then at least there's a little bit of compensation flowing back to the buyer by way of a reduced purchase price uh, so that th 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 they're compensated for not getting what they bargained for. So three reasons. Number one, let's make sure you file your financial statements and tax return. Number two, let's make sure there's no claims that come out of the woodwork within the first six months or a year and then I don't have to chase you down. Number three, if you tell me you're gonna stick around for a while, make sure you stick around. Again, you can have, you can have one hold back, but it's tied to those three different things. Uh, depending on the deal, usually it's something that the parties, if they're being reasonable, shouldn't have any difficulty, uh, difficulty negotiating you know, suitable terms. Again, there might be particular nuances of each deal that dictate a longer hold back or a bigger hold back or a smaller hold back. But, uh, but they are important. Uh, they are important to consider depending on the size of the deal and, and, and what the objectives are of the parties. Pat, do you ever see uh, a hold back on an asset deal? Is that just not something that happens or is there certain circumstances that can uh, come to uh, bear where a hold back is, is needed for an asset deal? Yeah, the, the risk is less with an asset deal because there's no risk of inheriting liabilities or hidden liabilities of a company. But if you have a situation where there's an asset deal and the seller needs to stick around for the transition, you might want to have a hold back to give them incentive to fulfill their obligations. Uh, or likewise, if there's a concern, maybe the buyer is concerned, well, he's told me this, I'm not sure if that's true, or sellers told me that the, this employee has promised to stick around a year, but I know they can leave. And so you ask the seller, hey, I, I want you to stand behind what you're telling me about this employee. So in certain circumstances, it does make sense, not as common as a share purchase deal, but again, in terms of what the nuances are of that deal, it, it certainly might make uh, sense to have it on an asset deal as well, but certainly not to do with that first risk of the tax return and, uh, and the financial statements because that doesn't become an issue in an asset deal. Tons of good information again here, Pat, and we're, we're, we're plowing through the time and I still have a bunch of questions on my list. So we'll try to get to uh, two or three more before we have to wrap up for, for this session. But uh, the next one maybe is, is, is fairly short, but I just think it's worth um, emphasizing to people, you know, what should buyers and sellers look for in terms of a, a lawyer? 
for a pharmacy acquisition or, or sale? Um, you know, how important is it to find somebody who, who has the right experience and sort of specializes? Okay, the short question, I'll give you a short answer. It's very important to make sure your lawyer, whether you're acting for buyer or seller, if, you're, if you have a pharmacy, make sure they've been involved in a, at least a few pharmacy transactions. Uh, they may have done other businesses, but there are certain things that are particular to a pharmacy transaction that if you're not familiar, you, you risk missing, again, whether from a buyer or seller perspective. And it's a simple question. And I think there's enough lawyers out there who have, who have done pharmacy deals. You shouldn't have any trouble finding one. And your lawyer, if he doesn't have any, shouldn't be offended if you try to seek someone out who's got a little more familiarity with, with pharmacy. Terrific. Uh, Pat, maybe we just talk real quick about uh, the purchase agreement. Most of our listeners may or may not know that it's a sizable document and requires uh, a fair bit of work, but one of the key components is representations and warranties. Um, maybe you could just talk about that for a minute and talk about um, how long does it take to actually draft uh, a final sale and purchase agreement uh, uh, on average for a pharmacy deal? Sure. The representation of the warranties are always a key part of the purchase agreement and usually take up the most pages. And quite simply, what those are is when the buyer is buying the pharmacy for a million or two million dollars, they're going to be asking the seller to make certain representations and warranties to them regarding the pharmacy that if for any reason they're not true, then the buyer will have recourse against the seller for potential damages. Those touch on things like if it's a company that there's no hidden liabilities, a seller is always asked to represent the financial statements, uh, the financial performance of the business going back three to four years. If the financial statements are a little bit out of date, they're going to be asked to represent that there hasn't been any material adverse change since the date of the last financials. You get all kinds of representations as to employees, uh, material contracts, uh, very, very important usually there's some negotiation between the buyer and seller's lawyers as to the scope of those as a seller you always want to qualify them you know to the best of your knowledge if you can a buyer will want some absolute representations on certain items that they're entitled to and it really gets down to an allocation of risk between a buyer and seller that what what happens if the financial statements were wrong and instead of the revenue shown it was actually two hundred thousand dollars less for some reason well, clearly that's a representation that if it's incorrect, a buyer should have recourse against the seller. There's some that are less important where sometimes a buyer can accept qualifications or lawyers have all kinds of fancy ways of trying to allocate things using terms like, is it a material misrepresentation or there's no material default under the lease? So very important part, as a buyer or as a buyer, you're generally not going to have much input in that. You rely on your lawyer to do that. But as a seller, when you're pre presented with a purchase agreement, uh, your lawyer is going to spend a lot of time with you and to review those representations to make sure that you can accurately give those or if they need to be qualified to give qualifiers where necessary. Uh, and in terms of how long it normally takes to actually sit down and draft the purchase agreement in the first instance, usually it's going to take a lawyer two to three hours. They'll have the letter of intent. They usually have a starting point agreement they're going to use, uh, but they have to consider all the particulars of the deal, make sure it's accurately reflected. Uh, but the back and forth between lawyers, depending on how busy the lawyers are, that could take two, three, four weeks easy to get sorted out. Uh, again, that's more a function of how busy the lawyers are who are working on your deal and what competing priorities have, as opposed to the actual time it takes for the back and forth. If you had two lawyers who had nothing else to do but to sort that agreement, they could have it done in a day or two days, but that's not practically what happens. So it's usually, it, it usually builds to getting the, the agreement get started at a point in time where a buyer's due diligence is starting to check out. It looks like the deal is going to go ahead. That's prepared to take the next step and tell their lawyer, okay, let's start on the purchase agreement. And, and what you usually find is the purchase agreement is dovetailing with all the due diligence and all the other documents and agreements so that it will get settled and signed uh, shortly before the closing date. And, and if all parties are acting in good faith, generally not a problem. In a perfect world, you have those agreements signed and sealed well in advance, but that's just not realistic and, and rarely, rarely ever happens. 
Terrific. So, Pat, I, I don't really want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to anyway to wrap up with, with the last question really today. And, and I'm going to do this because I just know why this – Phil and I get this question all the time, and, and uh, certainly our viewers and listeners will, will want to know. Um, can you just ballpark for us uh, what it might cost um, a purchaser um, or, or to see a purchaser sale through from start to finish in terms of, of legal costs for either a buyer or a seller? Sure. I, I would say for, for for either of them, on the low end, you're looking at eight to $10,000 if that's a s simple asset purchase or share purchase. Asset purchase is usually easier than share purchase. That could get anywhere up to twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000, depending on if there's lease issues involved, if there's a lot of employees, if there's uh, negotiating, consulting agreements with the seller after the fact. Uh, so if you budgeted uh, ten to $25,000, depending on the deal and what's involved, that's usually pretty, uh, at least in our office. I know in our office, we work a little differently. I can spend 10 or 15 minutes on the phone with somebody and get information, and I'll give them effectively a fixed fee quote of what it will cost them to get from A to Z. If it takes me two or three times longer than I think it, well, I stick to my fee quote. Uh, just that we've done enough of these deals. We're usually pretty good at, at, at doing things. But having said that, we do what it takes to get the deal done. Most lawyers won't work that way. Uh, if I were, if I said, if you had a firm in downtown Vancouver uh, acting for you on a deal that we our fees might be fifteen thousand, could you get a bill of fifty thousand dollars? That wouldn't surprise me. They they just work a little differently and. The four lawyers working on things and everyone's at 300 to 800 dollars an hour it, it can add up quickly uh the key point is this whoever your lawyer is it, before you engage them just have a frank discussion many people are afraid to talk about fees don't be afraid to talk about fees ask your lawyer what's this going to cost if he gives you if he or she gives you an hourly rate say listen i need an estimate of what it's going to take some lawyers are very reluctant well if things go sideways we really don't know it's just our hourly rate and it is what it is well if you're not comfortable with that, then maybe you have to look for an alternative way of dealing with it. But uh, they should be able to give you a fairly accurate range, especially if they're experienced, because uh, once you've done a number of deals, the issues that come up are, are generally going to be ones you've seen before and you should know how to handle. So in a nutshell, don't, don't, don't not hire the lawyer because some guy quoted you 3000 uh someone quotes you three thousand to do the deal you know sometimes you get what you pay for uh whether a deal is a two hundred thousand dollar deal or a two million dollar deal there's still a minimum amount of work that has to go into it and to make sure you're you're protected so 10 on the low end 25 on the high end with all levels of complexity is probably going to to, co to cover you but again just be frank have a frank discussion you don't want any surprises well, that uh, sounds like a really good place to end, and uh, we can totally relate to the, uh, you know, the amount of work. There, there's always a minimum amount of work, regardless of the size of the deal. And Phil and I run into that all the time as well. We get people who say, "Well, you know, my pharmacy's not worth that much, so your fee must be negotiable." <laughs> you know, what we're doing for you is the same. It doesn't matter how much the pharmacy's worth. Those are just numbers on a page for us, right? Yeah. So uh, we mm -hmm. totally get that. So uh, it's a good place to leave it. Uh, Phil, any uh, closing comments from your perspective before we wrap up here? No, I just think it's been great. Uh, thanks, Pat, for spending the time uh, to unpack a lot of this in more detail for us today. And and certainly anybody who's listening who has further questions, uh, uh, you can contact us via our website, rxownership.ca. And if you have a question for Pat, we can pass that on to him. Uh, and uh, Pat, thank you again for uh, being with us again today. No, thank you for having me. Again, I, I invite, if anyone's watching out there listening, we don't keep hourly rates. We don't track time. Feel free to call me and bend my ear for 15 or 20 minutes. You're never going to get a bill for that. I'm here to help. If the time comes, if time to do some work, we'll, we'll sit down and talk. But if you just want to talk about a deal or an issue, again, I'm here to help. Feel free to give me a call. That's great, Pat. And I just uh, want to say a thank you to you again, uh, not only for your participation, but for uh, Medisky and Company Business Lawyers for sponsoring this episode of Pharmacy and Flux.
And I just want to remind all our viewers, uh, this episode is being recorded on January the 25th, 2021. Pat isn't out there breaking COVID protocol and sitting in a pub uh, doing this. That's actually his basement and the quietest place in his house. Uh, so it was a good place for him to be to do this episode. So uh, a lovely background. Thank you, Pat. All right. Thank you for having me. Terrific. So that brings the close to this episode of Pharmacy in Flux. Thank you for tuning in and joining us. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the content and found it useful and uh, educational for you. And we'll catch you next time. Bye for now.